funny, isn't he? He's just teasing. Okay, guys, this is the Habits and Hustle podcast, and we are so lucky to have Darren Prince on today, who is a super agent, one of the top agents in sports and entertainment, whose book is a number one Amazon bestseller and a bestseller in many other countries, four other countries. Yes. Right? Yes. Uh, then had um, a major drug addiction, opiate addiction problem, and he hit rock bottom. But the good news is he is here today to talk about it and talk about his experiences and how he was able to climb himself out of that uh, dark place on the bottom and make his way back up. So thank you so much for being here, Darren. Thanks for having me, guys. No, it's great to have you. And uh, your, your story is... Um, not only is it uh, fascinating and interesting, but I think it could be extremely um, eye-opening and informative to a lot of people because of what you went through. So first of all, tell us, like, you're, you're a super agent. Who are you a quote-unquote super agent for and to? And give us some background. Uh, Magic Johnson, Dennis Rahman, Hulk Hogan, Ric Flair, Charlie Sheen. I've got Chevy Chase coming in town on Monday next week. I've uh, worked with a lot of amazing icons over the years. We lost Burt Reynolds uh, right. last September. Evil Knievel was a client for many years. You probably remember growing up. Sure. Uh, okay. Smoking Joe Frazier, Muhammad Ali, very near and dear to me too before they passed away. Wow. So your roster was pretty pretty steep there. Yes. Wow. And so were you, how did it all happen? Like when did you start being an, like how long have you been an agent and when did the drugs kind of, kind of, kind of peak into your life? Well, I started, I started a business when I was 14 years old selling baseball carts actually became a multi-million dollar company. At and 14? At 14, yeah. I, I was doing trade shows around the country, first in the tri-state area, then around the country. And one day I noticed that Ted Williams, Reggie Jackson, Pete Rose, Mickey Mantle, that all these guys were signing autographs at a convention. I saw lines wrapped around the corner. And although the baseball car business was good to me, you know, I had my own insecurities. And I think the whole celebrity thing was kind of cool and much more attractive and uh, you know, interesting to me than it was with the baseball card. So I kind of started looking into it in my early 20s and I, I sold my company and I started a sports memorabilia company and I started doing autograph signings with people like Muhammad Ali, Magic Johnson, Dennis Rahm and all the guys I have now. And eventually, so yeah, same people. Same people. So wow. then I, I built that company up and I sold it and I wound up getting into some legal problems, which I talk about in the book, the big FBI mm -hmm. investigation. And I lost everything. After selling my company at 19 for a million dollars, I was over a million dollars in debt by the time I was 23. And Magic Johnson never gave up on me. And he said, you're going to make lemonade out of lemons. And you're going to become stronger, smarter, and wiser because of this. And uh, what's your next move? And I had the courage because my dad asked me to bring it up to him to say, hey, I want to be an agent, but I know I'm not a lawyer. And right. he's like, you don't need to be a lawyer because mm -hmm. you know everybody you need to know. And I'm going to give you a shot to be my guy. Wow. So you went from doing cards to like doing a, basically like, was it just um, um, a car? You, you sold, did you sell the card company to them being an, to, to do autographs, like basically selling famous people's autographs? Basically. Exactly. We would do, we would like pay Muhammad Ali to sit in a room for a few hours, sign like 500 boxing gloves. And Pamela Anderson, I worked with her for years, Carmen Electra, Jenny McCarthy. And then we would, just have, we would just have distribution outlets with all different companies that knew we were like the king of autograph signings. Oh, gotcha. And it, we would, before we even walked in the room, I would have 80% of the merchandise already sold. And my guys would box it up out of the warehouse, ship it, and we go on to the next deal. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. And that's really young to be able to like figure that out pretty fast. Like, so you were like a natural born entrepreneur. Yes. Right. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So you sold that. Um, do you want to get into a little bit what happened in the book with the Fed, with the FBI investigation and just kind of. Sure. I was, um, but when it first started, it was 1995. I was, like I said, we were considered the king of the autograph signing industry and every person that we sold product to, we were there to witness it, except for Michael Jordan. And Michael was the biggest name in the world at the time, as such, for Muhammad Ali. And there was a company and a group that was selling me merchandise signed by Michael, and it was authenticated by a forensic document expert, formerly, that worked for the FBI. I had no reason to think otherwise. Um, and after about a year and a half of selling quite a bit of it, I got a call from an FBI agent on a Sunday night. Oh, wow. I literally just came back from spending the weekend with Muhammad Ali at the Essex House Hotel two weeks after he lit the torch for the Olympics. This was actually 96, it was. And um, he's like, we need you in Chicago. We need your expertise. 
because you're such an authority, would you mind coming out here this week? We'll fly you out. And I'm thinking, again, insecure, arrogant, little Jewish kid from Livingston, New Jersey. <laughs> oh, cool, whatever. He's like, well, we'll even pay you for your time. And the next day I get a call from another officer saying, do you have an attorney? And that's when I was like, okay, this is weird. So I called him my lawyer. And he goes, don't call them back again. He goes, let me call them. I don't know what the heck is going on. And he goes, you better bring me with you after he spoke to them. And uh, during the investigation, I spoke to the supplier beforehand, and he said they were trying to get him on tax evasion. Everything was legit. I paid him by check. He goes, don't give him anything on me. I built a relationship with him. I trusted him. And I kind of concocted some stories that weren't factual. Mm -hmm. And we took a break for lunch, and we came back. They had a tape recorder. And there was a major conflict of something that I said they were recording our phones. They were tapped for six months. Oh, my gosh. And I gosh. went from being a subject to a major target and three-year investigation of issuing refunds to people and <clears throat> trying to keep my reputation intact bled me from every dime imaginable and borrowing money from friends and family just to eat. And it was a really humbling experience. But at the end of the day, when Muhammad and Lani Ali wrote a letter to the judge, when Lon Rosen, who was Magic's longtime player rep in Magic, and Dwight Manley and Dennis Rahman, who was Dennis's player rep back then, all sent in letters. And my buddy Harlan Warner, who represented Muhammad Ali, all sent letters to the judge at my sentencing. I went up getting charged with making a false statement to the FBI. So it was like two years probation, paid a bunch of fines, wow. and was able to walk away from it. But it's a felony, so unfortunately, I can never do jury duty. Oh, wow. Thank You're gosh. Lucky. That's actually and lucky. I could probably lucky. never be a lawyer. So it's always on my record. But it was you know, one of those moments that you go through in life, and at the time, it seems like the worst thing ever. Right. And it was one of the biggest blessings, because not only would this book wouldn't be around Prince Mark, and it wouldn't have existed, because... Right. I knew I had, to, I had to do something else at that point, my reputation. There was a lot of haters in the business at that point that just, you know, I, I knew it was going to be a struggle to get back in. Wow. So you've had a lot of resurgences and re resurrections in your life. Yes. And you're not that old. No. Wow. No. So then how did it happen? Like, because your whole story is that really like drugs took you down and mm. badly, right? So yeah. when did, so then now you're 23 years old and you have to rebuild your business. Mm -hmm. So what, walk us through that. What happens? So let me get back to the, how the drugs started in the first place, and then I'll get to that. So I was 12 years old. I was at sleepaway camp. And you know, growing 12? up, often when I, when I, when I do speaking engagements, um, I, I talk about this. I grew up in small classrooms. I was told I had a severe learning disability, which now we know was more ADD. When I focused on something I was really passionate about, I excelled more than most. But for the most part, whatever it was I was learning, I had zero interest mm -hmm. whatsoever. So I was teased, I was made fun of, I was called an idiot, verbally teased by different people. And I think that does a number, especially in those developmental years on your psyche. And at 12 years old at sleepaway camp one night, I had horrible stomach pains. And I said to the counselor, I need to go to the infirmary to see the nurse. And um, she gave me this green liquid in a clear cough syrup cup. And I took it thinking nothing of it. And I'm walking back through the softball field to my bunk. And all of a sudden this feeling came over me that I felt like Superman. I never had this feeling in my life. All the inadequacies, the insecurities, the feeling of less than, the feeling of not being a part of went right away. I got back to the bunk. The guys are laughing with me, not at me. I was the cool kid, the good looking one, the funny one, the smart one. Um, everything I always wanted to be was in that little cough syrup cup. And I actually had the courage to go to the bunk next door and flirt with all these teenage girls for the first time in my life without any fear whatsoever. Woke up the next morning thinking nothing of it. And did all my activities. And I'm lying in bed that very next night, looking up at the sky being like, wow, that feeling was amazing last night. And I look at the counselor, 12 years old, and I said, hey, man, I said, we got to go back to the infirmary. My stomach is killing me. I did this for three weeks every single night until my mom and dad came up for visitation day and found that I was taking liquid Demerol. And um, so back then, there was an issue from the minute... I put that stuff in my system. And it took about three years until I was reconnected with drugs and I was at a dentist appointment. I had my wisdom teeth removed. And again, thinking nothing of it, I gave my mom these pills. I went home in pain. And that love affair came right back. I'm lying in bed, I'm on the phone floating, calling my friends. At this point, I'm making money. I had the baseball card business. I start, you know, feeling a lot bigger and better about myself. I call up some girlfriends, you know, had all the courage to do everything I couldn't do without something in my system. And then for about four or five years after that, I just, you know, like I said, having money, having success, I did everything, drugs, alcohol, you name it, whatever it was, I did it. And at 21, I was arrested four times in six months. Never one time did I look at myself in the mirror and say, Darren, you have a problem. It was always somebody else's fault why I got arrested. And, um, you know, after that, 
I wound up uh, becoming an agent around the time I was 25, 26 years old, and I knew the illegal drugs weren't the right thing to do anymore. And I knew I had morality clauses with my guys and, and girls that I was representing. And I developed sciatica. So to me, it was a great excuse to, you know, I always loved pills. I always loved opiates. I knew the effect Demerol and uh, the Vicodins had on me. And these doctors gave me whatever I needed. And when you're you know, walking in with a signed Joe Frazier boxing glove or sometimes with Joe Frazier right next to you because he's up at my house, I, it, whatever I wanted, they gave it to me. You know, I, I put them on the phone with clients. I'd bring them to events that my clients were at. They see the outs and say, this kid can't have a problem. This guy can't have a problem. Look at the business that he's building, right. that he's working for. And for a long time, it worked. I tell people this. It really did. For a good eight or nine years, I was a, a rock star. I was a superstar, whether it was the Mondrian out here, whatever it was that I had to go to network to go to different events and to schmooze and make sure I approached people in a very non-threatening, New Jersey type of way. I wasn't full of crap. Right. They knew that if I talked to them and tried to get a phone number, I always leveraged all on Magic's guy, Muhammad Ali's guy, Joe Frazier, Dennis Rahman. Um, and it's before the internet, so you had to, you know, make sure what you're saying, you were going to back it up. Right. And I would always follow up and always bring different opportunities to people. And uh, eventually it turned on me. I have no idea when it turned. But there was a certain point where it became my kryptonite. And whatever those magic pills and those opiates were doing for me, um, it was reversing. And slowly I started noticing myself changing. And I was miserable. I was moody. Um, had a lot of different chemical imbalances from being on a lot of other type of uh, prescription medication. And uh, I didn't want to live anymore in the end. And I lived that way for about three years where I would just go out. You would see me on a red carpet. I could be on Magic's plane going with speaking engagement. You would see me in action and think everything is great. From the outside, everybody thought I had it all. But I was just miserable inside. I had no idea how the hell I was going to escape the prison that I put myself in. Wow. So like for 10 or more so years, it actually worked to your advantage because mm -hmm. it's kind of like a liquid courage in a way, right? Like That's it gave, what it was. It gave you like the confidence and like the self, you know, self-esteem to kind of get all these deals done. Absolutely. So then what can happen? Abe, this is what you do. What happens in that? Does that just one day you just wake up and it just starts working against you or... Yeah, so your body gets, becomes dependent on the medication to really produce those neurotransmitters like the dopamine, the serotonin, and all those good things. But eventually, you you, you fire out your receptors, and yep. you, you can't self-correct and recorrect the way you used to when you were younger. Yep. You know, you took it, your body produced what it was supposed to produce. Yep. But that gets burnt out over time. It's like when you put too many miles on a car, it just doesn't run the same way. But doesn't it happen? Why didn't it happen gradually? <laughs> like, why would it? Did you feel it happen gradually, or you just feel like one day it was just like? No, that's why I said I don't know when it turned. Yeah, on like you didn't it was know. Just, it was just one day. It wasn't having the same effect, and um, I, I don't know when that was. It just turned. So then, what happens to you then? Oh, but so by, by the way, so you were literally like. A, you were like you knew at 12 that you had like some kind of addiction problem already because you had that feeling at camp 100 percent. I, I i knew something was in there that i needed more of what was in that what's in a cough syrup that can well liquid demerol is an opiate-based pain reliever you know but back then it wasn't probably as much of a controlled substance is that like a what is that like a diamond not like a dimetap or one of these no no, no like, demerol's a like, hardcore like no but i'm saying why would the camp be giving you something that's so serious uh, it don't they give you dimetap i do an interview because uh, i was 1982 but it was a different time you know when you're coming in there in excruciating pain and i'm bent over and i'm like i don't know if i need to go to the hospital or not i'm you know, make, making sure I build it up as much as possible. And they give me this medication. Hey, I don't go to the hospital. I go back to the bunk. Just got to a point after a few weeks, I didn't want to go to the hospital. I would just go in. She knew that was giving me whatever relief I needed. But that's crazy. Was, like, I mean, you probably went to a Jewish camp like I did, right? Um, back then. I would imagine Hinsdale was predominantly Jewish. Or like, you yeah. know, one of these like sleepaway yeah. camps that yeah. are like, and I would go, I would get like a Tylenol or a Dimetap, and that would yeah. be the that would be the limit of what I would get. Like right. I'm just like flabbergasted at the fact that you would get something so strong at twelve at like a sleepaway camp. Mm -hmm. That's what I can't believe. And so right at that moment you like felt something and it was like from that moment on you were yeah, done. It's, it's funny, your reaction to the sleepaway camp was like a lot of people, but don't get it twisted. The sleepaway camp did nothing because it would have happened that. Oh, another it would have happened. Oh, no, no, no. And I, I tell people that because yeah. there's a lot of talk show hosts and yeah. interviewers like, oh my God. And oh, I, I, I go, believe me, because it still happened at the dentist and it would have happened any other way. It's not my mother's fault. It's not my father's it's fault. It's nobody's I don't, fault. I don't believe in the genetic disposition. I truly don't. As a, somebody in recovery, I believe, yeah. You don't could believe be, in it, that. No, I, I think it could be in the household. And I could be, if you're living right. with addicts and alcoholics, you're more susceptible to trying it. But I know a lot of people that have drunk 
alcoholic and addicts, mothers and fathers, that never went down that road. Yeah. So what's the difference there? We always want to talk about the ones that get hooked because their parents were hooked. Right. My mom and dad did nothing to put inside me the anxiety that I always had. Right. They were loving, caring, amazing parents, and I had a great, I have a great sister. They did nothing. That was within a Darren Prince issue. Whatever reason why I never felt a part of why I was always such a nervous kid, why I always felt less than. I had a lot of friends, but on the inside, I never felt like I could be in the same room with anybody at such a young age and obviously into my, my late 30s. No, I agree. And I like that you said that because I always think it's interesting that people always have to have a reason or something to excuse what they're doing. Like it was, an, it was genetic or it was this or it was my, no, ba- no it was my upbringing, this. Like sometimes a spade is just a spade and you could just be that person that's within whatever you have. Yep. And I think when you start blaming and trying to find those other sources and reasons, it's going down a bad rabbit hole, Mm-mm. right? But yep. then you're the doctor. Yeah, I, I think that sounds, the sense of accountability and not blaming that's other the people word. was probably what yeah. helped you the most in your recovery because 100%. you can always find someone to blame something on. You know, this bad anything. thing happened to me, my parents this, my, yep. my girlfriend that. But if you take accountability on yourself, that's the first step. And I think that's even the first step in, in AA is saying, I'm, you know, yeah. I'm powerless. It's, 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 it's on it. me to make this change. Absolutely. So then what happens next? Riveting. So, so <clears throat> I knew I needed help. I was married at the time. And oh, you my, were married? My, my ex-wife, yeah, was trying to do whatever she could to help me, you know, have better days or whatever it was. But well, she, wait, how long were you married? So you were married this whole time? Or you no, no, I was, ma- I was married for about four years. So while you were... Pro- your- probably, probably the... the uh, I'd say the first couple of years we dated, it, it, it was manageable. It was fun. Everybody right. loved going out with me. We'd go to the Roosevelt when I was in town, whatever. Being in New York City, going to knowing Jason's, all the Tao and all their right. spots. And Jason Benz, a dear friend, going to all their functions. You would have just thought I had it all. Right. But again, like I said, at a certain point it turned. She was one of the few people that I knew behind closed doors how ugly and bad it was getting for me. I was setting my alarm at four in the morning, doing business with in other countries. I'd go in the living room of our apartment. I'd shut the bedroom door up and start snorting it. Vicodins, Percocets, um, or sometimes I'd put them under my tongue because I realized if I ingested it a different way now, I would start getting a little bit more of a buzz mm. because it would go right into the bloodstream, into the brain. But again, not thinking this is sick behavior. This is just me trying right. to be balanced. So what um, were you doing? What would, what would so, be like a daily, give me your daily routine back then. What would you do? I mean, my, my daily routine was probably waking up, not eating breakfast, going to the gym, putting some painkillers under my tongue, letting them melt, like I said, because that way on an empty stomach it would hit me a lot harder. But the problem was, sort of like he said, it got to a point where 30 minutes after I took it, I wasn't high anymore. Right. Now I'm stuck in my own head the rest of the day. Spiritually, mentally, physically, and emotionally, I'm stuck within this, being like, how the hell? Am I going to make this for the rest of the day? And it would be a few Red Bulls, whatever I had to do to stay awake. And then if I was at events with clients, I would take more pills. They wouldn't do anything. I would drink. Sometimes I'd get to the point of a blackout, not realize what was happening. How many pills were you taking a day? This is another thing I say. I wasn't, I wasn't an abuser. I was an addict. Maybe eight to ten pills a day. It was never more than that. Um, thank God. That's still because a lot. I think if I was an I think if I was an abuser and you hear about some of these stories where people are taking 20, 30 oxys a day, I wouldn't be here to talk to you guys right now. But you were dr- you were drinking with it? Yeah, not not every day, a few days a week. But you weren't so, an alcoholic. It was more. It was really just uh, yeah. O- for opiates. me, it was opiates. Yeah, right. For my so so we we tried everything, and I had my first overdose in two thousand and seven. My first and only one. I was with Dennis Rodman in Las Vegas. Dennis, by the way, has never done a drug in his life. It's a big misconception. He's, a, he's an alcoholic, admitting like, and that's it. And we were just celebrating. We were just celebrating a TV show that we did with Mark Cuban, uh, okay. Geek to Freak, and we had a big event that, that night. And um, I had a horrible case of bronchitis, and um, like a good junkie, I'm like, oh, you know what? This could be a good excuse to get some great cough syrup from the doctor. And the doctor came to the hotel, gave me Tussian X, which is a highly addictive opiate-based cough syrup that I love. It tasted like pineapple juice, and within seconds, we get you zooted. And he gave me a prescription for Vicodin and antibiotics. So on the way to the way, way back from CVS, I called the room, and I ordered three Baca Red Bull cranberries because I'm like, you know what? Even with a 100-degree fever or whatever, I'm going to go out. I feel fine. Went back, down two of the drinks, took a huge swig of the cough syrup, a, a handful of the, the, the Vicodins, and within... Two minutes, I'm on the ground, shaking, trembling, heart palpitations, hot flashes, cold flashes. My wife is looking at me, freaking out. Oh, my God, what's going on? I'm in and out of consciousness, foaming at the mouth, looking up at the sky, saying, God, don't take me. I don't know what the hell I did. I don't know what the hell I did. I'll never do this again. Please. She calls 911. They come in. They basically knock down the door. I got a needle in my arm, oxygen mask in my face, EKG machines everywhere. 
I don't even know what's going on. Like I'm, I'm seeing clouds, I'm in and out, I'm seeing light, I'm seeing dark. I wake up, it's now four in the morning. So I never made it out that night. I look in the mirror, I go into the bathroom, I'm like, you sick bastard. You sick bastard. Who does this? Who mixes vodka, cranberry, and, and, cranberry and Red Bull with Tustinex and Vicodin? I reach for the Vicodins, throw back three Vicodins, and I finish the rest of the bottle of Tustinex, and I go back to sleep. Because it was the vodka, Red Bull, and cranberry that did it. Right, it wasn't the Vicodin no, it wasn't or the, Vicodin, the, the Tustinex. Syrup. I go back to sleep. And they talk about the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over <laughs> again, expecting different results. So I had somewhat of a God moment. That next week, I had a little bit of accountability. I called an addiction psychiatrist, and he put me on Suboxone, which, as you know, is an opiate blocker. Um, at the same time, follow me on this one. I'm on anxiety medication. I'm on a mood stabilizer. I'm on an antidepressant. I'm chewing or snorting Ambien before I go to bed at night, and I'm drinking a few days a week to the point of blackout because there, I just I, I had to get something in my system because I just didn't want to be awake at this point. And July 1st of 2008 is when God started to finally come into my life. My uncle and his then girlfriend were in the 12 step fellowships of AA and NA. And he was visiting my mom and decided to surprise me, having no idea how bad it was. Andrea, his then girlfriend, looked at me. She never met me. She goes, Are you okay? I said, No. Never met her before. Told her everything, everything that was going on, having no idea that she was sober five years. And she goes, do you realize that you're an addict and your life's unmanageable? I said, absolutely. She goes, do you realize that you're powerless over this situation, that your life is a disaster? I said, 100%. She goes, and you realize this and this business means nothing right now. I said, nothing. And she goes, are you willing to get sober and do anything it takes? I said, absolutely. She put me on a detox plan for two days um, to help me get off the Suboxone because that was the hardest out of all of it. And it was a Sunday night. <clears throat> excuse me, July 2nd, 2008, I come back from the gym about 7 o'clock, and I lost my shit. <clears throat> and I called them up. I said, I can't do this anymore. My brain is fried. It's opiate deficient. I can't do it. I'm calling the freaking doctor. My uncle picks up the phone, and he goes, this is the goddamn disease talking. You got to go online. You're in New York City. You got to find a 12-step meeting and tell these people you're sick, you're suffering, and you need help. He goes, enough of this bullshit already. I said, there's no freaking way. I hung up the phone. I went into the bathroom. And I was taking clonopin for the detox uh, and the withdrawal and the cravings, which was somewhat of a non-narcotic. Does it um, help? Uh, it, it was helping. It was. So I went into the medicine cabinet as my ex-wife is in the room crying, knowing how bad I'm struggling. And I pour it out, hoping to get like two, Vicod uh, two uh, clonopin, four Vicodins come out. We swore we cleared out the entire place of all the opiates. Vicodins are one of the three opiates that I was addicted to. For a split second, ones? I'm holding them. And I said to myself, holy crap, what a gift from God. But then the change started to happen. And I heard a voice tell me, this is a curse from the devil. Um, I fell on my knees like this, shaking, trembling, and crying, and saying, God, I can't do this anymore. I said, I'm begging you. I said, take the business, the notoriety, the money, the success. I don't care. I need a day of freedom. And um, I heard a voice tell me that I got you and you're ready. I felt the warmth over here that I was on fire, and I stood up, I flushed the pills, I wound up in the living room, I found a 12-step AA meeting online, and I'm in a taxi cab 10 minutes later thinking to myself, holy crap, for the first time in my adult life, I wanted to stay sober more than I wanted to get high, and I walked into a church basement, and that was the day that my life began. July 2nd, 2008, I haven't picked up a drug since. I threw my hand up, I told these people, I said, I can't do this. I said, I got 48 hours clean. I'm begging you guys. I said, I'm an opiate addict. I'm a substance abuser of the worst kind. Whatever you guys can do to help me. There's 150 to 200 people. I never felt so comfortable around a group of people that I never met talking about this and having the courage to put my hand up. And they showed me one day at a time the softer, easier way to live this, not this life beyond my wildest dreams. And I was at... Um, I was at Dave Grotman's place, Komodo. We did an amazing party for my book release, and Hulk was there, and Dennis was there. And as I was talking, I look at both of them. I said, guys, it's no disrespect to you, but it wasn't the Hulk Hogan, the Dennis Rahman, or the Magic Johnsons, the world. It was these people that were all once of a hopeless state of mind, all addicts and alcoholics, that showed me the person that I was meant to be. That's amazing. Wow. Amazing. Yep. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. So... 
What like what do you like? Do you, you really think it was just like a, a voice from God, like in the bathroom when you threw down those pills, the clodipins, everything else? You like wh how come that doesn't happen? It doesn't happen most of the time. Like, what do you think it was? Were you you weren't someone who was like a person that like you weren't religious, were you at the time? Did you think it was a religious thing? Or what do you think it was? Just what came over? What do you think came over that ha that can happen? You know, we say in the in the fellowship that most of us are miracles. And I just think, uh, you know, I was so sick and tired of being sick and tired. I wanted it more than anything in my life. People have heard about these God moments, these awakenings yeah. that have happened. And you um, had one. He, yeah, he, he, I know a lot of people that do, and, and, and he knew, like, like in that moment, I, I, I was just, I, I was never more willing to give up everything to, to, to get the life that I, I always wanted, you know. And um, I also think, you know, God has a plan for every one of us. And although we go through so many tough times and sometimes don't realize it, that the tough moments is what makes us. Because it's so easy when you're on top of life mm -hmm. to just be happy, joyous, and free. But it's those rough moments of adversity that right. define who we are. And it's not about getting knocked down. It's about getting back up. And he knew that he had a bigger plan for my voice and my platform being an agent to some of the most iconic figures. He, I didn't know back then. But now going 10 and a half years and, and, you know, and, and celebrating you know, one day at a time, uh, another day of sobriety, he knew that I needed him. But then after a few years, and st once I started getting acclimated to this new way of life and comfortable in my skin, I knew that God needed me. Wow. And I started seeing these signs and getting these signals from him that there's a much bigger purpose. This isn't about you. You know, I did this for you so you can get out there and be a voice and help others so what are you doing so day one you go to the meeting what happens day two second day day two the same thing it was about the gym in the morning going to my meetings i would do the reverse commute i would go from new york to new jersey because that's where right. our office was and uh nothing else mattered i i knew that i heard so many amazing things from these spiritual brothers and sisters like it has to come first in your life anything else you put before it, you're gonna lose if you want what we have then do what we do you know, it's a program not for those who want it, not for those who need it. It's a program for those who do it. And um, I, I just became a sponge, you know. And it was just like, um, you know, I just wanted more and more of it. I wanted that spiritual intoxication. And after four or five, six months of it, I started realizing it's not just about picking up the drink or the drug. That's just a small part of it. That, you know, fellowship of AA means attitude adjustment. That's where the spirituality comes in. That's where the real blessings come in. That you learn to live like a better person. You know that just because we're sober doesn't mean life doesn't come at you. It doesn't mean life becomes better. We become better. Our perspective and our perception changes on everything in life. We become more peaceful, become more whole, become more confident in the way we can handle situations that used to baffle us. And that's when I just, the explosive blessings just started happening. Where I was like, this is like, just freaking amazing. I, I, Became and still am, and in my own way, addicted to meetings in a good way. Right, so you've transferred your addiction to something positive. It's, I mean, I'm giving it out to the world and speaking to thousands of kids in different organizations. And I'm at this huge vet fundraiser at Malargo on uh, February 2nd. Um, Buzz Aldrin's being honored. I'm, I'm the keynote speaker for it, 800 people. Um, it's all about mental health and opiate uh, awareness and raising funds for these vets. I mean, it's the greatest privilege of you know, of my life that, that I've been touched by God to be able to do this. And, you know, when I'm able to, you know, talk to high school kids and I know that I've impacted them so much because when I'm done with my speech, that so many come over to me with tears in their eyes and they're struggling themselves. And as for me to either mentor them or help speak to them about a loved one or a mother, a mother, father, sister, brother, cousin. It's amazing. You mentor a lot of people. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. But then how do you, like, so do you feel like every day is still a struggle then? Like, do you think about it or no? Oh, no, I, I, I think about, when I go to my 12-step meetings, that's right. really when I think about it. Okay. Because I have to think about it. Right. You know, self-confidence is a liability. I know people with 20, 30 100%. years have disappeared. I never will forget the life that this 12-step fellowship gave me. Because the people that do, they don't live. Mm -hmm. You know? And I'm not afraid of relapsing. And dying, that's easy. I'm afraid of relapsing and living. That's the hell. So 
I'm going to a meeting tonight on Robertson at 6:15. I just it's it's just the most Every amazing day, right? thing when I get when I get that one hour. Mm. I'm, I'm, I'm a better boss, I'm a better agent, I'm a better friend, a better son, a, anybody in my life. Um, I'm just uh, my fiance, you know, I'm just, she, she and I just moved out here. It's, I'm just a better person. I'm just, it's, it's, uh, it's just hard to explain. Like, I'm on that spiritual beam. I'm, I'm just the person that I was meant to be. And it doesn't mean I don't make mistakes and I don't screw up. Um, but the 12-step fellowship is there for a reason. There's a 10th step, which is you continue to take your personal inventory. When you're wrong, you promptly admit it. You know, I, I don't have a big ego now anymore. I have no ego. This is an ego-crushing fellowship. That's what I do. Those guys and women are the ones that have accomplished extraordinary things. I'm, you know, to me, i got to remember the most important thing is I'm a recovering drug addict one day at a time. That's what keeps my ego in check. That is who Darren Prince is. What I am and work, that, that's bull crap. It doesn't right. mean anything. So, right, so you define yourself by different measures now, for sure. So then, like, it doesn't sound like going back 10 years. that Did you did anything happen? Like, what happened with your wife? Was it like a, she knew you were a drug addict, obviously, mm -hmm. but she wasn't, it doesn't no. sound like. So that must have been a really hard relationship that, to kind of be in, right, when one person yeah, is. Yeah, it was brutal, one... and the divorce wasn't easy, obviously, knowing what I do for a living. Lawyers saw the people I work for and the wealth they have, and... You know, but the whole time I just stayed in faith. I stayed in the fellowship. I did whatever I had to do to stay connected to my sponsees, my sponsor, go to meetings, did a lot of prayer, knowing that, you know what, Darren, you indirectly put yourself in this position. But you cleaned yourself up. You still got the, you, so you cleaned yourself up while you were still married, it yeah. sounds like, but yeah. it still didn't work. So it, was it other didn't work. And again, we talk about that accountability. I always stayed in that accountability place, being like, you know what, took somebody from Australia, she moved to New Jersey and New York. She thought we were going to start this family. She wasn't perfect. I wasn't perfect. But the truth is, my behavior, my actions, you know, even when I was using to the fact when I got sober, put us in a position that we're in right now. Mm -hmm. And um, I wanted to stay that way because I knew I don't want to be in a place of resentment. And I just wanted to have this peaceful ending divorce at a certain point because she'd go on with her life and fall in love and have this, you know, this... I guess this life that she deserved to have that she thought she was going to have with me instead of pointing the fingers because that doesn't do good for anybody. Even when we finally settled the divorce and we were in the courtroom leaving, she came over to me crying. I'll never forget this. She said to me, um, I don't want you screwing your image and view up on marriage and love. And um, I said, Simone, I said, it's, it, it would never. I was like, you know, we had an amazing run with each other. But for me, I just wanted to tell you that, you know, the way I behave, don't judge other men by that. Mm -hmm. I say, because you deserve to be treated, you know, like a princess and get the life that you deserved. And she looked at me crying even more and then laughing, be like, oh my God, who are you? And what did you do to my ex husband? <laughs> Where is this guy coming from? Yes. That's the fellowship. Wow. And then, like, so then you never, but that doesn't sound like, and maybe I'm wrong, but did your business get affected? It sounds like the, even though you were a drug addict and you had this, you know, horrible experience and the three years were terrible, your business didn't really seem frayed that much. The business, the Prince Marketing Group, when I first started the first couple of years, I was struggling bad, you know, because of the party, you know, it, which was primarily opiates at that point. But you didn't lose your but, clients. No, I didn't, I didn't lose clients, thank God, but I wound up with a lot of tax problems. I was still coming right. out of debt from the other situation and the money was coming in, but it's going out quicker than it was coming in. And because I was so... Now I'm at the point where I'm 27, 28, real, you know, I had that arrogance to me. You know, look, you got Magic Johnson as a client. I mean, everybody else that was in Pamela Anderson, I was representing her in her heyday for a couple of years. Right. And so it was just real easy to go, go, go to my head and not really pay attention to the business, but be more a part of the BS part of it. You know, the right. image, the, the ego, the insecurity of, you know, I'm the man, everybody telling me I'm the man. And right. I, I lost sight of the business. And, like I said, the first couple of years I was struggling, but knock on wood, thank God, since probably 1999, I haven't you know, had those issues anymore financially. Right. But I didn't like, you know, when I think of rock bottom, I think of people who are such bad addicts that they lose their family, their home, their business. They're like living like under like the 405 base. They're living like in, in, their, in a outside and on the streets. Yeah. So you were obviously fortunate enough that your rock bottom was internal, it feels like super. I lost, I lost the sense of self. Yeah, you lost the complete sense of self, mm -hmm. but you had, you had something, you had some stuff that I feel that you were really fortunate about. You had lo your, your, your clients seemed loyal to you yes. and you still had like the, 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 your business still may have been struggling, but you didn't 
lose every everything because you were you saved yourself to some extent right right yep. so what happens with people and like i see this all like i see this unfortunately a lot of times when there's somebody who has they have everything going for them and they just can't get out of their own way and get that experience when someone comes down from god and says listen you're going to like clean your shit up or you're going to be in trouble like for, for longevity. I mean, people can do it for like a, a finite period of time hmm. and then they just start it up again, either alcohol or drugs, and they just can't get that break. They can go to AA, it doesn't work for them. They can go to whatever it is. Like, what do you say to people? Like, not from a medical side, but from someone who's like experiences it, lives it. How does someone get out of their own way and really seek solace, really? You have to keep, in my opinion, you got to keep going to the 12-step fellowship until you hear somebody right. share they can really identify with. And here you've got actors, actresses, musicians, people at that level of success to realize, like, wow, you know, I'm no different than them. They're no different than me. Right. Here's a little thing that you can identify with. And if you've gone to meetings for a month and you've found one that you can identify, keep going. There's so freaking many of them. You're going to, you will find somebody. It's a numbers game that's going to say something. You need to want it. You need to want it. You need to want it. Like people, you said something that was very true. I think self-confidence in that way is the worst thing that you can get because you feel the confidence that you don't need the meetings. You don't need to be with people. You can just do it on your own. And that's when people fail, right? Well, if you don't want it, you're screwed. When you don't want it, right? You don't want I mean, it, or you screwed. think you, you want you, it. You, you can send a loved one, a friend all day long to 12 step meetings. And if they don't want it, guess what? They're not going to get it. Right. You know, we say that. So it's the truth. You know, for me, I, I had that willingness. I was at that point where I, because I had that willingness and that accountability, and I was sick and tired of being sick and tired, I was given the gift of desperation. Right. How does your body feel now, not having any opiates? Are you, like, not now, but being like when you were fresh off the opiate thing, was yeah. it really hard to adjust from like not knowing from such a young age how to, how you, like all you knew was having some kind of like, drugging you right to modify you yeah it, it took a while right it did it, it took it probably took a good year or, or more until i was able to like go to events and start you know kind of getting reacclimated and be able to talk to people and walk and think and do all these things but eventually now it, we talk about we intuitively know what, how to handle situations that used to baffle us every one of dennis Raman's trip to north korea i've dealt with every single one of them sober i was the man behind every single one of them me and my boy Bo, who goes out there and does all the heavy lifting, and never thought a single time about picking up a drink or a drug. You know, I lost Joe Frazier and Muhammad Ali in sobriety. Never thought about it. I lost my closest friend in the world, my dad, almost two years ago. And you get this beautiful gift of your perception and your, pers your perspective being changed on everything. Right. And my gift was I got to feel the feeling sober. I got to grow through it and go through it at the same time. And you use this, like you said, now instead of relying on those opiates, you re your addiction is like these meetings, the feeling of community within those people, within that group, right? Yeah. Do you have like a very specific routine you do every single day also to kind of keep you on point to make you feel in control? Like a lot of, like this is what habits and hustle, this is the whole thing, right? Like. Most people who are successful in any walk of life, be it being a recovering uh, drug addict or being a, a major CEO or a big entrepreneur of some kind, usually they have like certain habits and rituals that they do every single day mm -hmm. to kind of keep them in, in, on, you're smiling yeah. at me on point. So what is yours? No, you're laughing. I do because I, I still have OCD. So it's uh, always, so, yes. I'll usually try so to hit the 12 I. step meetings now that I live in California. This is a 7.30 that I hit. If not, I do it after 6 p.m. But the gym six days a week. I'm pretty religious with my diet. Um, I've never been in better shape in my life. I start with my phone calls and my emails back. Give me your day. Give me back Monday. East. You wake up in the morning at what time? Um, usually 6.30, 7 o'clock. Okay. Uh, it's breakfast. What do you uh, eat? Uh, oatmeal, blueberries, or egg white, or you know some healthy type of yogurt. Okay. Um, and then I'll, I'll hit the gym. Um, after the gym, I usually come back, take a shower, try to hit a 12-step meeting. If not, like I said, I'll hit one after 6 o'clock when my when I'm completely slowed down because I'm doing myself a complete disservice if I'm there and I'm texting and that I've been down that road too much. Right. Like I need my brain to be completely in that place where I'm absorbing um, what's being said so I can take it out there in the world and help other people. 
and uh, then it's just work. I mean, it's it's it, there's some days that are just absolutely psychotic in our business, and there's other days that are just like smooth sailing. Right, it's part of the agent life, you know. So what do you do as an like yeah? So then you so you are OCD. You do your morning ritual. What kind of workouts, by the way, do you do? Like, what do you like? Are you like a weights and cardio kind of person do you do um, like I'll, I'll do cardio two days a week and the, the other times i'll do a lot of core body weight routines um uh, i do a lot of the foam roller stuff because at my age it's not about heavy weights anymore right. just about making sure like i'm loose and feel as good as i could possibly do i do a lot of jumping rope okay yeah good so then exercise the, the, uh, those meetings are extreme every day or six days a week for the meetings i try to go every day i was in canada um uh, with rick flair and my fiance and, 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 and his wife, Who's Wendy, who we love this it? weekend. Oh. And I couldn't. There was just no time to get to A meeting? meetings. Oh. Um, and we were just so crazy working. I didn't get to the gym, so I took the weekend off. But you know, I've got so many other ways to get the spiritual connection. I was listening to um, recovery speakers on the airplane. I put my, I put my oh, earbuds yeah, yeah. on. I listened to somebody for an hour. Um, I'm just like, this and is great. And that just gives you like that this feeling. This is great. just gives me... It's like I'm a diabetic, and that's my insulin. Right. So I just hear what I need for that day, and it doesn't mean look. I can't go, you know, four or five days without it. I, I just, I'm just not myself. I'm not in that complete peaceful state of mind right. where I could just deal with life a lot easier. Right. So why not take that hour a day? Because if this was ten and a half years ago, you better believe I'd put that hour into chasing down what I really need to get. Right. Right. You just transferred it into this. Mm which is obviously a much more healthy thing. Yeah. So then what do you do day to day with your work? So you still represent the same people. So are you doing deals with them across the board? Are you doing just speaking deals? Like what, like give me the day in life. Uh, with projects your like, like today, um, we, we just firmed up with magic. He's doing a keynote speech for Oracle NetSuite on February 13th in Atlanta. He just did a bunch of voiceovers for the, for a small business campaign. Um, we have deals with certain cryptocurrency companies. Mm -hmm. Kevin Harrington from Shark Tank's a client. We have a lot of different business partnerships. We did a deal for Charlie Sheen's ex-wife with a CBD company uh, for skin, a CBD skin cream company that's coming out uh, later this year. We've never heard of anyone doing any kind of um, CBD company. This so, is so rare. So yeah, I know, right? I'm kidding. And um, so that should be exciting because it's a female skincare product with some CBD. Oils in His it. His ex-wife being uh, which one? Denise. Uh, Denise, Denise Richards. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, Hulk Hogan. We we just read up uh, companies in, in California. It's called Lomart. It's an auto title on company. What's it called? Auto uh, auto title on company called Lomart. They've been oh. running radio spots mm -hmm. and television ads. So our guys just keep extremely busy. You know, Dennis Rodman's filming a commercial in Toronto. I can't talk about it yet, but that's coming up next month. Um, these guys are just very blessed. Charlie Sheen, same thing. I mean, we're always getting different opportunities for every one of uh, these guys and, and women. It's, it's, it's a blessing because the business almost at this point, I like to say, takes care of itself. Mm -hmm. But the Internet and people with word of mouth knowing how to get to us, just a lot of wow. these great leads come in. Who, so how do they, okay, so are you out there looking for new clients? Or are you kind of just make, managing the ones you have? Like what's, we're, we rep, we're, rep, we're fine representing the ones we have. Right now at this stage in the game, it's more about the corporations. Mm. We look for the corporate accounts because the corporate accounts, you then have access to their budgets mm -hmm. and you can go out and hire any celebrity with their budgets. Absolutely. So that that's just been a big shift that we made over the past four years, which is amazing because once they take one of our guys, then we can go out and start hiring other talent that we don't represent. And because we're giving them and their agent a big check right now they want to work with us on other things 100%. so it's a lot easier than just starting from scratch and saying oh let's try to chase down this guy or chase down that guy oh yeah and then my other passion is obviously with the book aiming high out right now i'm, I'm doing a lot of keynote speaking yeah um a lot of different charity events schools businesses um it's, it's, been, it's been amazing yeah like it seems like you are a big obviously a big mental health advocate so yeah. So who's representing you to go out there and do all these speaking engagements? Um, do you I've represent got, yourself? You know, I, I, it's funny. I actually <laughs> do have an agency. My office is handling And then I've got this group called Speakers for Change. Oh, good. Out of, uh, I think they're based out of Cherry Hill, New Jersey. And they deal with a lot of recovery speakers as well as uh, individuals that have had breakthroughs and trauma and came out on the other side. Wow. Yeah. And you only do for drug or for alcohol as well? Do you think, is it, I, I is combine it's... them both because, okay. look, I, I, I drank. Drinking wasn't ultimately my problem. Your but thing, it's, yeah. You know, here's the thing. If I'm talking to a business or a group or teens, it doesn't matter what the word is. If, yeah. if you identify with substance abuse, you know, whatever I'm saying, or something that's creating unmanageability in your right, life, right, right. you don't like the person you're becoming. Right. The 12 steps that I preach and talk about very discreetly can help anybody, anybody that's suffering with an ailment, an issue, an addiction, um, something that's 
taking you to a very dark place. Wow. I mean, is there anything else you want to talk about? I feel like we got like your whole experience down. The, like, I mean, Abe, you were, <laughs> you were, you know, uh, uniquely very quiet this whole session. <laughs> You guys are having great banter here. <laughs> well, no, I didn't want to. Go. Is there anything you want to like add or or ask? I just us? think I mean I've seen obviously a lot of people in the addiction community, and I think I'm trying to you know pull some takeaways from the stuff that you said. I think you know you know recovery is a lot about spirituality, like you mentioned. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have to be re- a religion per se, but understanding that there's a plan, there's something larger than just yourself. Because I think what a lot of people with addiction is. They think to themselves, just in that moment, oh, it's not a big deal if I if I take this one pill or yep. I take this one. But if you if it's part of a larger plan, then you think the impact of what you're doing is much larger, and mm-hmm. and, and that's a big problem is that people don't see the, the 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 future value of their current actions. And I think that's something you were able to do. Number one, number two, you mentioned the accountability, um, and I think that's important because you can always find someone to blame. So if you can take it on yourself, accept responsibility. And then the third thing is you, you don't shy away from adversity, which I thought which I thought was interesting. You mentioned you know you deal with life's challenges. You you don't you go to events where you you know you're going to be encountering difficult situations or people that may make you bad you know make bad decisions, but you face them and you overcome it. Mm-hmm. So it's it's impressive to me. I, I've been listening and hearing you. You know those are the, probably the three takeaways that I would get from you know your recovery journey. You read the book too. Uh, I talk about this might not be somebody in the history of the fellowship <clears throat> started in 1935, um, so about over 84 years now, that has been to more meetings around the world than me. Yeah. One of my greatest passions, I was in um, Morea. I took a, sh- uh, a shuttle boat 45 minutes each way uh, to Tahiti. Uh, a French English speaking person held a meeting with seven people in recovery for wow. me. Uh, two days after Christmas. Um, I was in Sydney, because that's where my fiance's family is from. From where? Uh, in Sydney, Australia, oh. um, over Christmas. Four meetings in six Wasn't days. your wife from Australia, that, too? How odd is that? Can you imagine <laughs> a Jersey Jewish kid marries that's a crazy. Australian from Brisbane and gets engaged to another one from Sydney. Met, meeting them both. In, Are you meeting them on like an app for just no, Sydney people? No, it, it, it's, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's the crazy. Maybe you have a type, thing. exactly. So, you know, I've been... To meetings in Monaco, Anguilla, Turks and Caicos, um, uh, just London. It's the most amazing thing in the world. Look, people go to church on the road, right? I go into a, a into a church basement, a clubhouse, a temple, whatever it might be, and you're not home, but you're right at home. The minute you throw your hand up and say, I'm Darren, uh, I'm an addict from uh, the United States, it's a love and a warmth yeah. and a fellowship and a bond with these men and women that nobody could ever understand. That I know that if I was having a problem later that day, I can call anybody in that room and they're going to be there for me. Right. And then whatever words I'm saying, I'm like fresh blood in that room. They're like captivated with whatever I'm saying because they're used to hearing the same stories over and over. Right. So we give and take from each other. And it's just the most beautiful experience to, to be able to have that anywhere in this uh, in this world. I've been to meetings in Tokyo. It's uh, something I get so excited about. I, I look on my app and I see what ones are around and I do whatever I got to do to get there because that that one hour break again it gives me all the gratitude that i need to understand this blessed life that i get to live one day at a time so then have did you ever have like a a fall like did you ever like kind of fall off and kind of jump right back on the wagon again or you just were smooth sailing the whole 10 and a half years well i mean you could say it that way but i also try to get sober years earlier and it didn't work so i think once i finally really wanted it and surrendered um but i do the work Right. You, you know, I've, I, I, like I, I've got all mm-hmm. the big badass recovery advocates in the world are all my people from Chris Herring, Tim Ryan, Ryan Hampton, uh, Garrett Haidt, Anna David. We, we, we know, um, you know, uh, Brandon Novak. We all talk about it. I'm a rep for Banyan Treatment Centers. They've got 11 proper su- properties around America. And because it, it needs to be part of my life 100%. And I've got this network of other advocates that have the same mission I do. Did we you are using our voices to go out there on a grand scale and let the world know that hope and recovery exist. That if you're in this dark pl- place, contact us. This is what we did. Um, it exists. Did you go to rehab though or no? No, Just strictly... no and I probably should have. Right. I tell people that. I, I don't think the way that I did, I would recommend that. That's probably the one mistake I made because... You know, I could have most likely had a stroke or some other ailments because of it. And I should have, but, you know, at the time I was too busy. That's, right, right, that's right. kind of, that was kind of the thing. I'll do it if I could detox without going to a rehab. Right. And so, yeah, 
but then you did the eight, but obviously it's worked for you and yep. you've been very serious about it. So, wow. Okay. I feel like, is there anything else that I have to like ask you while you're in front of me right now? <laughs> I think now? we got it. I, I mean, we I, did. I feel like I do, but, um, wow, this is exciting. It's riveting. And, um, wow. Sounds like no matter, no matter what, in what aspect of your life, having those good habits is important. I think we've, like what we said that, like yeah. being, you know, his habits and rituals in the morning is waking mm-hmm. up, going to the gym, having mm-hmm. eggs or oatmeal and going to meetings. Cause you know, some people do meditation. He yeah. does meetings. So yeah. I think that, I think we're good to go with you, but Thank you for for coming on. I appreciate it. And, you know, it was great to meet you. And best of luck. And I'm going to finish reading this book. And I'm glad we shared our wrestling story. <laughs> I know. I was going to say, like, I wanted to ask you a bunch of wrestling stories. I was I was asking Darren off camera about all the Hulk Hogan, Ric Flair stuff. Okay. I was a big fan. And, like, these guys are still making, like, a ton of money off of... Off off of like just being them. Yeah, their legacies being them. And... Can I say some of this stuff? You don't, do you care? If I just say, like, a Hulk Hogan still making, like... A lot well, of money. I don't know exactly what they make, but they're no, making. No, but they're making like, yeah. a ton of, like a ton of money off yeah. it. Like, they're still like... Yeah, and in many ways, they're bigger now than they've ever been. Yeah. It's well, unbelievable. One question I wanted to ask you is, you know, do you think, you know, technology and a lot of the, the movements now with on-demand apps, anything that can be helpful in the recovery community? Because, you know, AA has been around for 60 mm-hmm. years, 70 years. But it's never really modernized to being like to game. To, it's never been gamified, mm-hmm. and everything else we do has been gamified. You know, even healthcare now is becoming gamified. Mm-hmm. I'm just curious what you think about that. Absolutely. I mean, there you, you can actually go to a 12 step meeting on your iPhone. Oh, you can. Okay. I was, I was in Fiji for New Year's last year. Yeah. I was on a I was on a Skype meeting mm-hmm. with 10 other people. It's unbelievable. For 45 minutes before New Year's, they shortened it because it was only 10 people, but everybody Are shared for five minutes. It's unfreaking unbelievable. I'm looking at the ocean, sitting here on the beach looking at my iPhone and we're all telling each other stories. I said, technology is amazing. That's amazing. You know? I've always wondered like the way people incessantly check Instagram for their, that little red icon and the likes, like imagine you could get that same satisfaction by saying that you were sober today or something like that. Yeah. I'm just curious if you, if, if you think that technology has a role in, in addiction. I, I do. And I think it's a lot easier for people nowadays to stay sober than it was, even though there's a lot more drugs out there than, and, and, and alcohol and substance than it was years ago. I think for somebody to say they went away or uh, they went on vacation and they relapsed or for somebody to say, you know, I tried it for a month. I don't know why I couldn't get it. There's so many resources technology wise. You, there's nothing like walking into a clubhouse or a church basement or a temple mm-hmm. to feel the love of people, but it's not an excuse. There's no freaking way that you can't tell me you couldn't log onto your computer. You can go onto YouTube, just like any other type of spiritual breakthrough or motivator or mentor. You type in AA speakers, NA speakers. You could sit over and commute for an hour yeah. and be healed and make sure that you're Amazing. on the path for that day. You know? Right. You're all about like no excuses, basically. No. Which no. is, which is, which, me too. Anything else, Abe? You said more. We can talk, we can talk for hours, yeah. but. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you again for coming on. Thanks. I want to. Uh, say everyone go go check out his book called Aiming High because it's a great read and very informative. So it's aiminghighbook.com. That's where they could buy it. It's aiminghighbook.com. You heard it here first or second or third. <laughs> Thank you so much. Bye.